Hebrews 9.26 says that, God put, uh, that Jesus put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What that tells me is that uh, God is not in the business of sending down fire from heaven or crashing airplanes into buildings or sending earthquakes or fires or tsunamis or droughts or rain or, or, you know, or any of those kind of things uh, because he's mad about sin. I heard a person also say one time, that, you know, you hear all these kinds of things amongst Christians. Uh, if God doesn't judge San Francisco, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. You might have heard that before. You ever heard that before? Do you understand why they say that? I, I assume you understand what, the, what San Francisco has a reputation for. If God doesn't judge San Francisco, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, upon whom, by the way, fire rained down from heaven. Again, it was not the devil, it was God. But I would say, in response to that, if he does judge San Francisco, he's going to have to apologize to Jesus. <laughs> Because Jesus has already taken the sins of San Francisco, and you and me, by the way, lest we think that they're really bad and we're not so bad. Uh, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I don't want to try to make it say anything other than it says. I, tend to, uh, I, I would prefer just to say in his role as a mediator. You see, what he did to mediate between God and man was, it's not that he changed all of our behavior, but he removed sin as an obstacle, as a barrier between God and man. Now, God can receive us with no sense of guilt, with no need to judge us for our sins. He can receive us because of our faith in Christ, the mediator. Now, as far as our behavior, that is a long-term project. That's a, that's a long-term process, and that's something that's taking place as we grow as, as Christians. Uh, a, a verse that bears on that. There's a lot. I don't want to get on that topic today, but uh, in, in Philippians, first chapter of Philippians, Paul said, he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion. That's what Paul says. He that began a good work will bring it to completion. That implies an ongoing process. And the good work that he began in you is to save you. And the work that he will bring into completion is uh, when, your, uh, when your outward uh, uh, behavior and actions and lifestyle line up with who you are right now on the inside. But... Here's something, evidently, this writer to the Hebrews thought was pretty important. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now go back to chapter 8, verse 6. It says, But he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much more? He's the mediator of a better covenant. Now again, a mediator means one who mediates. He mediates. Um, he mediates. I remember one time... Uh, at, a, at an Easter service. We have these early morning Easter services. And they used to invite me to speak at those sometimes. And I think I finally convinced them not to invite me anymore. Because uh, I remember at one of the last ones I talked at, I thought Easter was when we talked about the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. And so I was talking about the death of Christ. And by the way, it wasn't an accident and it wasn't a crime and the Romans didn't do it and the Jews didn't do it. God did it. And it was to pay for sin. And I was emphasizing that and uh, highlighting that fact that he paid so sufficiently that God considers it paid for and that he has as a mediator, we were just talking about that, uh, removed sin and made peace between heaven and earth, made peace between God and man. And uh, whether you, be I, this is what I said that got me in trouble, I said whether you believe it or not, he believes it. Uh, whether you acknowledge it or not, he acknowledges it. He as far as in the mind of God, he believes it's already done. Well, uh, a, a man in town got mad. You know, I don't, this is another thing I don't understand. If I hear somebody say something I disagree with, I just shrug my shoulders and go my way and say, oh, well, it's free country, you know. Uh, everybody's different strokes for different folks. But for some reason, people feel compelled to call me up on the phone and tell me they didn't like what I said. And so that's happened more than once. Uh, all kinds of things I've gotten in trouble for. Using the message translation, people don't like that. I had a 45-minute call with a lady one time because I used the message translation. And she's, don't you know that's the devil's translation? I said, well, I didn't think the devil's in the business of, uh, of making translations of the Bible. You know, I, that's just a funny image to me, the picture of the devil sitting down. You all demons help me, and I need to translate the Bible for Christians so I can mislead them. Uh, anyway, she was mad about that. Well, anyway, uh, a, a man was there, and he was really upset about that um, because from his point of view, he looks around and all the world and half the Christians are still sinning and he wants to put a stop to it by scaring them and saying God's mad. And, uh, it, you know, and I wasn't making God scary enough or mad enough. And uh, he was really disturbed about that. And he didn't like the, the notion that God has, uh, has dealt with sin already. 
But you see, if Jesus was successful in what he did at the cross, we need to acknowledge, uh, you know, forget, if, if, if you can't follow the logic of it, forget the logic and just think about what we just read from Hebrews 9.26. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Another one is John the Baptist. When he saw Jesus walking down the street, he said, there is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, I wonder if he really did or not. Uh, yes, he really did. He really did for the world and for you particularly. See, as Christians, we come into the possession of that by, by believing it, by putting our faith in the mediator. Let's go on reading. That's his mediation. Oh, he's made peace. That's what I was going to say. Uh, there was a barrier between God and man. In the Old Testament, we, we read God saying to the nation of Israel, your sins have separated you from your God. Now, that was true when he said it, but it's not true anymore. Because as far as God's concerned, sin has been put away, has been dealt with, has been removed. Now, it might be in your mind, as he says to the Colossians, he says, but you, one time you were aliens and alienated, enemies of God, in your mind. It might be in your mind. I meet a lot of people who think they're alienated from God in their mind. Uh, but God has removed the barriers. He's not mad. Uh, and he's not crashing planes into buildings or sending earthquakes or tsunamis. And if he was, where would he stop? Why stop with one plane, one building? Uh, why stop with one little earthquake? Why not just send another flood? Wouldn't that take care of it? <laughs> you know, the story of Noah's Ark, remember that? You've read it, haven't you? At least you might have seen the movie where Noah, Noah's, I mean, he's a tough character, Russell Crowe, that's pretty good Noah. I mean, that is, that's one kind of Noah I never imagined when I was reading that. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, if you read the story, at the end of the flood where God wiped out f all flesh, he said, uh, he said, he put the rainbow, remember that? And that's a, supposed to be a token that he would never again uh, destroy the earth by water. You know what? This is interesting. Uh, by the way, we're coming back to Hebrews, but I was just thinking about that, and that just reminds me of something. Look in Isaiah chapter 53 just for a second. Now, you know, uh, what I really want to read is in chapter 54, but I want you to see what he says in 53, because... You know, 53 comes before 54. And look at what he says in this prophecy about Jesus. Uh, beginning with verse uh, 3. Isaiah 53, 3. Speaking of... Isaiah 53, 3. Yeah, yeah Isaiah 53, 3. And we're going to read something in chapter 54 just in a second. But just notice this prophecy of Jesus. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But, verse 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now, it's pretty clear in those uh, verses I just read that there are iniquities, there are transgressions that are mentioned, but it says he was wounded for our transgressions. Did I read that right in verse 5? He was wounded for our transgressions. The implication is we should have been. That, see, we should be punished. Justice would demand that. But instead, he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. We should be bruised or punished for our iniquities, but instead he was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement, by the way, means punishment. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. Notice it says it's all on him. It's ours, our transgressions, our iniquities, but the punishment, the pain, the bruising, the wounding was all on him. And then verse 6 very uh, poetically says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. You know, I've heard... I've heard more than one message based on those words with, and leaving off the last part of the verse. And then the person presenting it gets really mad. Says, that's right, we've all, we're like sheep, we've all gone astray. And you sheep, you better straighten up and fly right. That's kind of mixing metaphors, isn't it? You sheep better walk back in the pen. <laughs> Guess they don't fly right. Oh, oh more than once, I, you know, we've all gone astray. And then everybody's supposed to feel bad. Yeah. And you're supposed to think about how you've gone astray. We've all turned to his own way. And you're supposed to think about how you've turned your own way and feel bad. And that feeling bad is supposed to scare you and make you conform or behave better. But you see, the last part of the verse does not say, 
and God is headed up to here with you sheep, and he's going to send down lightning bolts and kill every single one of you. You sheep, you think you got away with it. He's going to shear your hide. He's going to shear your fur, whatever they do to sheep. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of how this might be, uh, how this might make God scary. But you see what the text here says is, we all like sheep have gone astray. That's true. That's very true. We've all turned everyone to his own way. But this is a prophecy. This is a prophecy about the one who is to come, Jesus, we recognize. And it says that God's way of dealing with the sheep going astray is, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. It doesn't say that he laid on us the iniquity. He laid on him the iniquity of us all. I think you can see that that's talking about Jesus and his, uh, mediatory, uh, uh, his mediation on the cross. Now, chapter 54 comes right after chapter 53. That's a no-brainer. So chapter 54 is written in the light of what we just read in chapter 53. Notice what it says about Noah and, uh, and the meaning of that. Uh, let's see now. Uh, let's see, verse 7. In a small moment have I forsaken thee. By the way, when was that? In a small moment, he said, I have forsaken thee. He's writing to, I, I would say, all of us. When did he, in a small moment, uh, were we forsaken? It was, you know when it was? When Jesus was on the cross, 1 Peter 2.24 says, He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. So personal was that that Paul says, writing about it, says, I was crucified with Christ. We were there, in a sense, in that he was bearing, carrying everything wrong with us on the cross. And you know one of the most notable things Jesus said when he was on the cross is, my God, my God, why have, hast thou forsaken me? Do you remember that? He said that when he had entered fully into our, come into union with us as sinners, and entered into our God-forsaken condition, and this is what the text is alluding to, I believe, when it says, in a little moment, or a small moment, I have forsaken thee. I think that's another prophecy about the cross. But with great mercies I will gather thee. Verse 8, in a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. I believe that's alluding to what we just read about in the previous chapter. Jesus suffering, being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Now, if you want to know who he's talking to, it's whoever is redeemed by the Lord thy Redeemer. Now, notice what it says about Noah in verse 9. Verse 9. For this, <clears throat> what's this? This that he's talking about. When he, in a moment, forsook, forsook us. In a moment, a little wrath hid his face from us. Alluding to the cross. <clears throat> For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For, here's what he means. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. We know he said that. That's what the rainbow is all about. He says, in the same way as I swore to Noah that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. By the way, what were those waters for? That was judgment. Would you agree? That was judgment on sin. So he says, as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee. That means wrath or angry. I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. He says, just like the waters of Noah, I swore that I'd never do that again. And now, in that same way, you, the redeemed, I say to you, I will never be angry with you. I will not rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills shall be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace, I believe this is talking about the new covenant, be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy upon thee. How about that? He says, just in the same way that uh, the waters of Noah will never again cover the earth, that judgment, he says, in the same way I have sworn, I'll never be wroth. Now, that's King James. That sounds a little hard to understand. Uh, you know, I, I haven't read this, and so it's a little bit like in court when they tell the uh, prosecutor, don't ever ask a question that you don't already know the answer to. I haven't already looked this up in the Amplified translation, but let's just take a chance and see what verse 9 says in the Amplified. See if it says something different than wrath. I don't. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you or rebuke you. 